Hello and welcome to Credit Shift News and Update. This week I'm Paul Sweeney, co-founder and chief strategy officer here at Webio, and today I am on my own and I will still be bringing you the recent news stories, events, reports and trends in the credit industry. Okay, let's dive into some of the details. In general industry news, new research conducted by Totally Money has found that one in five, that's 9.7 million people in the UK, of current account customers are overdrawn by an average of £697, with £1.4 billion spent on bank overdrafts each year. The research showed that on average, one in five people are £697 overdrawn each day, that with most high and that with most most high street banks charging customers between 35% and 39% APR, overdrafts are an expensive way to borrow. For some, overdrafts are a ghost debt. There's no separate card, account or app. And if you've been with your bank for years, you might not even remember applying for one. Analysis by Moneycoms has suggested that millions of people could be paying thousands of pounds worth of interest charges on personal loans due to a lack of transparency from lenders. Under current regulations, banks only need to provide 51% of customers with an advertised offer, and the representative or advertised rate is the lowest rate that the minimum percentage of customers will pay. However, most of the time customers are not given the advertised rate as they do not have a good enough credit score. The research conducted for Totally Money shows that for a typical £3,000 personal loan with a subprime of 69.9 APR, a lower credit score of around 400 to 500 could end up adding £2,499 worth of interest over 36 months. This means repayments would total £5,958. A £5,000 loan could attract an extra £3,942 in interest, while a £10,000 loan would see a borrower paying back an additional £13,541. Finally, this week, UK workers who rent are set to be almost £4,000 a year better off as a new universal credit system is rolled out in the UK. This is a monthly payment for people who are on a low income, unemployed, or who find they need help with living costs. How much you receive depends on various factors, including age, living conditions or situation, employment status, and whether or not you have children. It is being commented on that those with long-term disabilities are the biggest losers in the redesign of this system and of the benefit, so we'll keep an eye on that one. Moving on to Section 2, Fintech, Buy Now, Pay Later, AI and Related News. Our first story is that Visa has launched a new variety of tap-to-pay solution in Latin America and the Caribbean. Pay for online purchases just by tapping their Visa debit, prepaid or credit card on their own NFC-enabled Android phone. In effect, your phone becomes your own contactless payment terminal. The merchant's enabled app has to be downloaded, is my understanding of how this process works, but the solution offers an alternative to consumers who do not want to store their credentials on a merchant's website. Former Credit Shift interviewee Sean O'Toole said on LinkedIn that if it qualifies as a card present transaction, merchants could end up saving a ton of money. In our second story, I recently came across this handy new UK-based buy now, pay later service called Bumper. If your car has had a crash or a bit of a bump, you can repair now and pay later. They have the usual three-part instalment plan, no interest, and you can choose to get it repaired from one of 4,000 repair centres. I really like this model in that it's a great example of how using digitization and a payment plan uh, and some payments innovation creates business model innovation. There are plenty of times when I could have done with splitting a bill um, and not minding which garage actually does the work as long as I'm not paying a big hefty initial fee. And hey, maybe there'll be some 
benefits down the line from having paid with Bumper, like guaranteed service or money back guarantees, etc. So I'll keep my eye on any other such services that are hitting the horizon. The third story is technology innovation could result in a transformation in the way people pay and get paid for things, according to the deputy head of the Bank of England, Sarah Breeden, recently. Radical developments include technologies that enable an online customer's funds to be reserved at time of purchase and automatically released to the seller only once physical delivery of goods is confirmed, helping to curb fraud. Other examples include the ability of train commuters to be automatically refunded if a train arrives late without the need for the current administrative uh, red tape. I must say, I absolutely love that idea. The technology authorizing payment upon delivery could help many small businesses ease the problems of late payments, but she also signposted that a new report from the Bank of England on payments innovation would drop in early summer, so we'll definitely keep our eyes peeled for that. Again, just to sum, sum, uh, summarize all that, I, I really like the idea that we can use uh, payments repayments, payment terms, payment flexibilities to not only make the payment process better, but actually to think bigger in terms of business model innovation and what might be possible. Section three, we like to bring you new reports that might be of use to your own strategic review processes. And this week, it's Embracing the UK's Open Finance Opportunity, the inaugural CIFIT Coalition Paper from the Centre of Finance, Innovation and Technology. Open Finance looks to improve the lives and financial well-being of individual people and small UK enterprises. The Open Finance Coalition conducted research, ran pilots and proof of concepts, and demonstrated that increasing access to data creates better outcomes for consumers and for businesses, and all that ultimately changes lives. For small businesses, by accessing greater data sets and personalized information, the CTIF's work suggested that over 25% of SME loan applicants that had been referred for manual underwriting and would potentially have failed to receive an offer of credit could justifiably have been given access to finance if more data had been available. It is estimated that SMEs regularly find it difficult to obtain timely and affordable finance, thing we've mentioned numerous times on the show here, with research indicating a £22 billion funding gap. Additionally, just being able to instantly get their VAT information or data from the company's office was found to be considerably uh, useful and to speed up various submissions processes involved in gaining access to finance. Additionally, working alongside Citizens Advice, CTIF developed a personal financial data dashboard, which enables Citizens Advice teams to service up to an additional 150,000 more financially vulnerable people. And on average, help those people get an extra £1,000 in support per year. Now, some of this was around standardizing the information collection process, such as the standard financial statement, using open banking, credit reference agencies, and the HMRC. The coalition streamlined the process of financial assessment for both citizens' advice clients and the advisors. So traditionally, the onboarding process would necessitate manual entry of 600 intricate data points, and all that consumes really valuable time and resources. The citizens' advice clients found themselves navigating queues, presenting the bills and the statements, while their advisors devoted nearly 30% of their time to data collection, analysis, and recording. Well, I must say that the Citizens Advice Centre here, uh, alleviating that journey, you know, pre-populating data, ability to assess employment benefits and dividend implications, uh, just getting clients to a clarity on their financial standing more quickly and accurately 
is just a huge, um, just hugely important. Um, and, you know, getting breakdowns on housing, spend, utilities, groceries, childcare, all this is very, very difficult to do. Now, we have extensive experience of this ourselves at Webio, so we see the benefits of being able to do this through our conversational approach. And I think what we're seeing here is the ability to get that information from other sources, so not even have to ask the clients what their spend is, will be, again, another acceleration of the digitization of this process and really help people get through it faster and probably higher completion rates and and more accurate data rates too. So all this really looks to me like a great example of the co-pilot being used, the co-pilot strategy for both the agent and the um, uh, the end client of the service. And I think the open finance roadmap has been recommended and a new working group has been set up to prioritize use cases. And I think they've been recently enabled by the UK government to run some more programs in the open finance area in the UK. Well, that's it. That's our updates for Credit Shift this week. I hope you found some information in there to stimulate your thinking, get you thinking about how innovation might be enacted in your organization, or maybe think about some of the longer term trends that are impacting you and your business. Join us next week when hopefully we'll have Cormac back with us. And also we will be dropping some more interviews this month on the Credit Shift interview. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for that.